right, so the uh, title of my talk is uh, Hidden Debt, Hidden Deficits in State and Local Government Budgets. So as an overview, what do state and local governments do? Uh, well, the Tenth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution specifies that all powers that are not granted to the federal government are reserved uh, for the states and the people. So there are a number of those uh, powers that the, uh, that the states uh, have, uh, have assigned themselves. Uh, states raise a fair amount of revenue from various sources. In fact, uh, uh, they raise uh, around, in total, uh, around $3 trillion of, of revenue. Where do they get that, that revenue? Around $2.2 trillion of it is from what I call own sources. So those are primarily taxes, like property taxes, sales taxes, uh, individual income taxes, uh, and the rest uh, come from uh, charges or you know, fee fees for services that, that governments provide. So um, you know, there's some states out there that have no income tax, like Nevada. There are some states like California where top earners uh, will pay uh, marginal tax rates of as high as 13.3%. Okay, so just the, at the state level, that's in addition to, to any federal taxes. And then uh, if you own property pretty much anywhere in the country, you're going to be paying property taxes to a local government entity. So uh, if you buy a house, you know, one of the main expenditures of the house is uh, not only going to be the mortgage and the upkeep and things like that, but it's also going to be paying property taxes to your, to your state and local government. So, so they're raising about $2.2 trillion from those sources and then an additional uh, 0.6 uh, trillion in federal transfers. The federal government gives state and local governments uh, a, a fair amount of, of, of funding, in addition to uh, uh, setting some rules that allows them to, uh, to raise money on, on favorable terms. What do state and local governments do? Well, they're, they're providing a number of uh, public services that are not directly provided by the federal governments, and they're, they're provided by, by state and local governments. So uh, first among them is elementary and secondary education. That's funded and provided for by, uh, by primarily by local governments, by school districts that are um, local government entities. Uh, public welfare, higher education, uh, health and hospitals, police and corrections, and highways are some of the other general, uh, general categories. So higher education, for example, is uh, you know, uh, state universities. Uh, health and hospitals uh, uh, includes uh, you know, part of Medicaid spending. Police and corrections, of course, public safety um, and uh, other categories. So those are the things that state and local governments do that uh, uh, are the, the federal government is not providing those services directly. Those are what state and local governments do. And, and those are pretty important things, actually. You know, education, public safety, okay, these are, these are, these are vital public services. Um, so uh, I said, you know, they, they collect about $3 trillion a year of, uh, of revenue, or about $2.2 trillion they collect, and, and, and the rest of it they, uh, they get as transfers from the federal government. But uh, one, one question I, uh, that, that kind of motivated my working on this was to ask whether state and local government budgets are balanced. Uh, so I'm going to talk in a bit about what exactly a balanced budget is, but uh, you know, generally speaking, a balanced budget is one where you are, I guess, you're spending about as much as you're taking in in, in, in revenues. And you can think of that, you know, in, in terms of your household spending. Uh, if your uh, expenditures are about the same level as your income, then your your budget is balanced. If you've got more income than your expenditures, you have a surplus. If you've got more expenditures than your income, then you're running a deficit. And that's the way we think about it with, uh, with governments as well, and with state and local governments uh, being no exception. So th this graph uh, uh, is from a paper uh, from the, uh, the Urban Institute, and it shows uh, expenditures and revenues by state and local governments uh, over a period of uh, 2000 to, uh, uh, to 2016. And these lines, you can see, they're, you know, they're, they're moving more or less in tandem. And if you just looked at this, you would think, well, it looks like the answer to, uh, to the question here is, is yes, that state and local government budgets uh, are in fact balanced. You look at those lines on the right in particular, I mean, they're really just, they're, they're overlapping. I mean, expenditures are about the same as, as revenues. So um, uh, if you just look at something like this, you might think, well, there's really, you know, there's no, no cause for concern here. It seems like the, the government uh, budgets are, are balanced if you looked only at this and you, and, you, uh, and you stopped here. And even over time, it seems like they've pretty much tracked each other. Sometimes during recessions, expenditures have exceeded revenues and, and so on. But, but, but generally, it seems to, it looks like they're, they're, they're balanced according to this. By the way, why is this an important question? I mean, you're going to talk to uh, John Kogan tomorrow as well. I'm just tying my shoe here, excuse me. Uh, John Kogan as well uh, about uh, federal government uh, budgets uh, tomorrow. 
what, uh, why is this an important question? Why do you care whether, the, whether your state or local government is running a balanced budget? Is this some wonky question that economists like to ask? We have to measure why, why should you care in particular, whether the, the budget is balanced of your, of your city or school district or something? In state bonds, for example, right? So maybe you're an investor in state bonds. You might want to know whether they're going to be able to pay uh, the interest on those bonds or whether they're going to default on those bonds. So in the future, they're going to at some point have to raise tax rates or you know, raise tax. They're going to have to do something to bring it back into balance because you can't run increasing deficits forever. Okay, Monet modern monetary theory aside, which is uh, you know spurious theory, you cannot run deficits forever. At some point, you're going to have to start paying that down. And the, you know, the, the reason that you can't, you're not going to be able to keep running it forever is because the more and more uh, interest expenses you have, the bigger part of your budget that takes over, and it's just not going to be sustainable. You're not going to be able to run a government and provide these services if you're deep underwater with, with debt. Right? In the same way that if you think about your household, uh, you know, if your household gets deep underwater with debt and you're, you're spending all of your income on uh, you know, interest on your credit card bill, you're not going to be able to do things that your household wants to do. So two th one or two things will have to happen. Either they'll have to raise taxes or they'll have to cut spending on these things that we care about, like uh, education or public safety, uh, just in order to, you know, to, 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 to meet these payments. Right? So, so, that, so we're going to care a lot about that from the perspective of uh, both uh, us as taxpayers and also us as beneficiaries of these, public, these vital public services. We want our state and local governments to be able to continue to provide these uh, vital public services. Um, one example that I'll mention later, you know, is uh, you know the city of Detroit. Right, the city of Detroit went bankrupt, and uh, the, in the years before the bankruptcy, there were a lot of problems with the provision of public services in 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 Detroit. In fact, a lot of cities have, you know, challenges with their with their with their uh, the quality of their public schools. But uh, also public safety in Detroit got to the point where if you called 911, it took an hour for somebody to come. So that, and that was a, a sign of the fact that, that, the, uh, that the, uh, the public safety departments were dramatically under-resourced. Under um, so, okay, so, so far we're looking at this, all right, no cause for concern, you know, what's he talking about? The, the revenues and the expenditures are the same. All right, so let, let's, let's dig in a little more to what exactly a balanced budget is. All right, so let, here's a really simple, this is a model, right? Economists like to make models. It's a really simple model of a, of a, of a government. The government uh, uh, levies taxes, all right? There's an income tax return. And uh, let's suppose that those taxes go into that bag of money there. Uh, the bag of money is directed to the uh, state authorities. That's a picture of the uh, building, uh, uh, Capitol building in Sacramento, okay, Capitol of California. Uh, you can visit. Um, and, uh, and then the state authorities uh, take the money that's, uh, that they've raised from those income taxes. And if you think of this is all happening in a given year, you know, they, they budget and they spend money on things that we might care about. Uh, highway construction, education, uh, public safety, both police and fire, right? So uh, if this is a model, and this happens every year, and the size of those two bags of money are the same, then the state is running a balanced budget. And in fact, 49 of the 50 states have either state level constitutional provisions or statutes that require them to run a balanced budget. So 49 of the 50 states are actually claiming that every year they're running a balanced budget. And the 50th, is, uh, the 50th does actually de facto run a balanced budget. Um, that's Vermont. Vermont is the one state that does not have a balanced budget. They have high taxes, but also high spending, but also high taxes. So, uh, so these balanced budget requirements, they would make you think that uh, states are running balanced budgets. But, what, what could possibly be going wrong here? Well, one thing that could be going wrong would be if the individuals who are performing these services here are being promised some benefits that they're going to receive when they stop working. Uh, so here are some thought bubbles that these, these individuals are, are, are thinking of here. All right, so this is uh, this construction worker, $19,000 per year when I retire. They've been told by their employer that they're going to receive $19,000 per year when they retire. Here's a, uh, another one. I'll tell you where these numbers come from in a minute. This person is thinking they're going to get $43,071 per year when they retire. Uh, this person is thinking they're going to get $88,101 per year when they retire. Uh, this person is thinking they're going to get $100,000 per year when they retire. And this would be in addition to any uh, Social Security or other you know, federal benefits that they might be getting. Uh, this is, these are benefits that they're, they're promised by the state or local government that is employing them. And these are, this is an old arrangement called a defined benefit pension. And uh, I think, you know, unless some of you end up going into one of these professions, uh, you are not going to have a defined benefit pension. You're going to have a 401k or something like it. 
you're going to have uh, a, an arrangement where the, your employer says to you, we're going to put some money in an account for you. It's going to have your name on it. It's going to be tax deferred money. You're going to be able to invest it however you want to. And then when you get to a retirement age, you're going to have to you know, use that money to figure out how to fund your own retirement. This is a much older model of, uh, of retirement benefits. And, and what it is, is it's where the employer promises the employee that the employee will receive there are going to be monthly payments, actually. Uh, so these are annual numbers. But monthly payments, every month you're going to receive a check from your former employer. And what that means is that your employment relationship or your, your relationship with the employer that you've worked for does not end when you leave employment. It, it's going to have to continue because you leave employment and that employer still owes you money. They owe you these amounts of money here. So what are these amounts of money? So this 19000 this is the number that you'll, you'll read uh, public employee unions across the US, they like to publicize what the average number is of the average pension that anybody who has worked for the government will receive. And that number is $19,000 per year. Uh, that's a little bit misleading because it includes people who might have only worked for the government for a very short amount of time. So like if you only work for, you know, work for the government for five years, and then you, know, you turn 60 and you start drawing a pension from that, you know, from that state or local government, that's going to be a pretty small amount of money. If you work for 30 years, it's going to be a much larger amount of money. Uh, $43,071, that's what the, uh, the New York City Teachers Union says that New York City teachers receive from the city when they retire. Also misleading because it also includes part-time people who've only worked for, as a teacher for a few years. Okay, 88,101 per year when they retire. This is a, uh, the average for a uh, full career uh, California highway patrol person. So whenever I get stopped on the highway for driving too fast, uh, I try not to bring up this topic with the officer, tempted as I am to ask him you know, what his formula is and where he is and is, you know, that I, you know, let him know that I know that he's going to receive uh, you know, an average $88,000 per year when he retires, probably at the age of 50 or 55. Uh, but uh, I generally try not to bring that up because I think it's not going to help my situation at that time. Um, and, uh, and then this here, $100,000 per year when, uh, uh, when they retire. Tens of thousands of, of, of uh, retirees in California uh, are, uh, are promised pensions of more than $100,000 per year when they retire. And these retirement ages tend to be pretty low. They're not the 65 to 67 that, that you, you know, uh, which you're eligible for Social Security. They tend to be more like now 55 or 60, with some of the local governments even still having retirement ages of 50. So this is expensive for state and local governments to offer these things. So now you're starting to see, okay, balanced budget, right? It looked fine if those two bags of money were the same size, but what if the two bags, what if the two bags of money are the same size, but also this, the government is promising people these, these pensions? We better hope that the, uh, the government officials are planning, are preparing to be able to pay out these, these payments somehow without having to tax you again, because otherwise you're going to end up paying both for the services that you're consuming today from the state or local government, so you're you know you're you're paying taxes now, property taxes for uh, you know for for police service, for uh, for education, and so on. If they don't set any money aside to prepare for these pensions, then in the future you're going to have to pay double. You're going to have to pay for the services that you're going to want at that point in time, and also for the pensions of the people who worked for you in the past. And uh, and so and if the uh, actually if the working horizon is short enough, there are there are some cities you can look at it, and really they're they're sort of so behind on these uh, on preparing for for these commitments that current taxpayers are in a way supporting three generations of of public employees. They're supporting the people who are currently providing the services. They're paying them for the services provided, and they're also essentially paying you know, in, in real time, the pensions of two generations of, of retirees, you know, one who is a uh, dwindling generation of those who are kind of in their mid-80s, and another one generation that's, you know, more in their, you know, in their, in their early 60s. So, um, so, uh, so it's, it, it should be clear from this that just looking at money in, money out can't tell you exactly whether the government is running a balanced budget. You have to think about these deferred promises. What is the government promising that they're going to pay in the future that might not be reflected in, in today's accounts? Okay, so uh, I mentioned this, that these are called defined benefit pension plans. The employer promises the employee a monthly check at retirement. Very common for uh, government workers in the U.S. Now rare if you work for a firm uh, in the U.S., but it used to be common uh, for firms in the U.S. And then what happened was that firms discovered that this is actually a very expensive arrangement. And uh, there were some uh, accounting uh, rules and also government regulations 
that made firms aware of the fact that they had to actually prepare to pre-fund these things. They couldn't just promise employees that they were going to pay them a pension in the future and not prepare for it. That happened in the, in the 60s. Uh, that happened. There were a number of, of uh, companies that basically just promised employees pensions. Large companies, car, a car manufacturer called the Studebaker Company. You've probably never seen a Studebaker before, uh, unless you've watched that old classic, The Muppet Movie. They drive around an old Studebaker. But, um, uh, but the Studebaker Corporation promised its employees these kinds of pensions that you saw in the previous slide. They didn't prepare for it at all. They didn't set any money aside. And then the company went bankrupt, and the employees got nothing. So uh, federal government authorities said, well, this isn't good. You know, we need to figure something out here. And so they, they implemented some accounting standards and some funding standards uh, for, uh, for, for uh, corporate pension plans, for plans sponsored by companies. And that has led companies to be much more prudent about offering these defined benefit uh, uh, arrangements. What you're going to get is more likely a defined contribution arrangement, which is, as I mentioned, more like a 401k or a 403b where uh, you have a private account set up for you, the employer will pay into it, you'll have the opportunity to pay into it. Um, it's not a debt if it's a defined contribution plan. The employer obligation is over when the contribution is made. When you leave the employer, you get the money that is in the account and that's it. The employer is no longer in a, kind of in a, in a, in a relationship with you, in a creditor relationship with you. If you're a public employee and you have one of these pensions, the, uh, even if you leave, you know, you're still in a relationship with that, with that, uh, with that employer. So here are another, so the good news is that the state and local governments, they're not just making those promises and just not setting any money aside. I mean, that would be really absurd if they were doing that, if they were making literally trillions of dollars of promises and not spending money aside and not setting money aside. In, in fact, there are around $4 trillion of assets in state and local government defined benefit pension funds. These are these massive pools of money, $4 trillion of money. And uh, the question that we're going to be asking is, okay, that sounds like a lot of money, but is it is it sufficient? Can we really, uh, should we take state and local governments at their word that they're running balanced budgets, that they're setting aside enough money to meet these promises? This graph shows some other uh, numbers just for, for comparison. Uh, the, uh, the second bar over is, you know, I mentioned companies used to sponsor these things. They don't so much anymore, but there's still actually a lot of old line companies, uh, the car manufacturers, the airlines, uh, some telecommunications companies, uh, Boeing, you know, uh, uh, large manufacturing companies that still sponsor these, and, and they're about $3 trillion in assets in those, in those plans. Uh, the third bar over, those are 401k plans, so that's kind of the prevailing arrangement for newer, younger firms, over $5 trillion in those. And these things over on the right, this is the uh, nonprofit sector equivalent of the 401k, so just people ask me, well, you know, you know, as a professor at Stanford University, what do you have? Okay, I have the thing over on the right, which is just like a 401k, but for a, a nonprofit uh, organization. There's about a trillion dollars in those. Okay, so the question that we're going to be asking you today is, will these assets be adequate to pay the pensions promised to public sector workers, or will you have to pay the public servants of tomorrow and the pensions of today's workers? That's the question. Is this enough, or should they be setting aside more? Okay, so, um, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, the, how, do they, how do they budget for this? They contribute to these pension funds. Your governments do this to prepare for these payments. That's the, the $3.8 trillion in the previous slide. States have discretion to determine what is an adequate contribution. So this is where the balanced budget thing comes in, right? The, the, the state is sort of allowed to decide, are we contributing enough or not? And they're given discretion to decide whether the contributions that they're, that they're putting in there are sufficient, and, uh, and then we sort of are supposed to take their word for it. So if they say they're running a balanced budget, we might want to ask, well, how'd you figure out whether you're setting aside enough money to pay those employees uh, their, uh, their pensions? They can set their own rules. Uh, companies can't set their own rules, but state and local governments can set their own rules. Uh, what do they do to implement these rules? They hire people who are called actuaries. Now, an actuary is a career, uh, you become an actuary if you're an accountant, but you don't quite have the personality to be an accountant. That's what, that's what an actuary is. Um, and maybe you're actually maybe a little better at math than, than uh, your, your average accountant, because it's actually a very mathematical, technical type of, type of job. Um, they are experts in making these types of calculations, okay, so they kind of look like this, sort of. Uh, and. Uh, the, 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 uh, the thing you should keep in mind, though, is some of these actuaries apply stricter standards than others. 
So uh, when, I, when I lived in Chicago, uh, I, started, I was working on this stuff. Uh, I worked in Chicago for eight years. I taught at the University of Chicago for five years, uh, at Northwestern for three years. I, I kept getting this email from this guy who said, uh, I used to have an actuarial firm. I've read your work. I'd like to talk to you. He used to, he used to be an actuary. He used to run one of these firms. He was retired. I didn't know what he was talking about. I got a lot of inquiries. Uh, he, he, he kept writing this email saying, I think I have something interesting to tell you. I don't want to say it over email, but just, just meet me. It'll be interesting. Okay, fine. Okay. He came up to Evanston and we met. And uh, he said, yeah, you know, I used to run the, the largest actuarial firm in Chicago, but we went bankrupt. I said, why'd you go bankrupt? He said, well, our biggest client was the city of Chicago. And I told the city of Chicago that it was actually going to be more expensive than they thought to be able to meet the obligations on these, uh, on these pension promises here. And they said, uh, are you sure about that? And he said, yeah, I'm sure. And they said, well, you're fired. We're going to find somebody else to give us uh, an opinion that is more consistent with what we'd like to hear, which is that it's not going to be very expensive. And this is in part why uh, Chicago is one of the cities around the country that's in the worst financial shape as far as these promises are concerned. Some of their funds, their promises to public safety officials are only, only about 10 or 15% funded if you use proper accounting. Uh, so some actuaries apply stricter standards than others. And most states are not under any legal obligation even to set aside what their actuaries say would be prudent. I mean, actually, what I said to this guy was, well, why didn't they just hire you and then just do what many other states do, which is to say, well, our actuaries told us we had to set aside, you know, a billion dollars, and we just set aside a million dollars, and that's fine. Uh, why don't you just report what they told you to do and then report what you did? Uh, and he said they didn't want to do that. So, uh, and most actuaries really are making wildly optimistic assumptions. So these are the actuaries that the city of Chicago wants to hire and apparently did hire because the actuary's job is to give the city a funding plan that will lead to the, the plans being fully funded. And the actuaries in Chicago have apparently given the, uh, the, the city uh, plans that have led to the plans being only 10% funded. Um, so it's a little more complicated than that because the city in some cases did set their own rules to not do what the actuaries said, but, uh, but uh, the point is that most actuaries are making wildly optimistic assumptions, and the, one, the actuarial firms that have survived are the ones that are willing to make the most aggressive assumptions. <laughs>